Today's teaching is called Glory to God Through You. And this is about baptism and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So just forgive my voice. Uh, actually, let's just start with a prayer. So Daddy, we thank you for, we thank you for this meeting today. Daddy, we thank you for your good word for us today. Daddy, we thank you that you desire to give us your Holy Spirit and that you desire for us to grow up and be like Jesus on this earth, including character, including good deeds, including acts of love, and including the acts of power. And so, Daddy, we just pray that you will open up our imagination, that you will open up our believing, and that we will take to heart that we can be like Jesus, that you want us to be like Jesus, that we're to do the same works as Jesus. Daddy, open up our believing and let us lay hold of these truths. Daddy, we just uh, thank you for building our, our believing, our faith, and sending us off to do good works. We thank you for um, we thank you for these new folks who've come to the meeting today, and we thank you for this time. And amen. All right. Oh. And in the name of Jesus, voice, you will function properly throughout this meeting. You will function properly. Well, so let's just, um, let me get over here. So the last time I tried to talk about the Holy Spirit was actually last Sunday. I was going to Costa Rica um, for a business trip. And uh, I was invited to preach at a church uh, for one of my coworkers. And... And like that whole week before the trip, I was just on the verge of getting sick and I kept fighting it and fighting it. And I managed to, I fought it off, you know, and I was good and I was able to, to preach. And I was talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then sure enough, yesterday, like I, I feel this coming against my, my, uh, my voice. And so it's, Satan really hates the topic of the Holy Spirit because so much of the church has not woken up to the fact that we can have the Holy Spirit and be like Jesus. And so Satan doesn't want us to know that. So twice in you know, two weeks, he's trying to shut me up before talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's not going to work, okay? When did you do that? I got back, um, what's today? Uh, Friday. Last Friday? Yeah, so, yeah, this past Friday. So I, it was Sunday a week ago that I was preaching. Yeah. But here we are. All right, so pop quiz. So who would like to live a life that brings great glory to God? All right, this is a real pop quiz. Who wants to bring glory to God? Okay, so who would like to see more people in your life uh, come to believe in Jesus? Okay, good. And then who would like to heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead just like Jesus did? All right. Okay, we have, the, we have the right crowd today. Okay. okay, now who thinks it's possible to do these things? Yes, I do. All right, we got some work to do over here. All right. Okay. Well, the best part here, we see the dead stuff. We need some We'll get there. We'll get there. All right, so all of these things are possible if we get the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then we need our believing to open up. Because we we've been living our whole life limited with human thinking, which is pretty narrow. And we need God thinking. You know, so we need to get out of the box and start believing in bigger things. So that's, it's, that our challenge is to work on our believing. Jesus had perfect believing. And he was a man with the Spirit of God with perfect believing. So he could do anything that needed to be done. Whereas we've lived as humans for a while. And we need to fix our believing. So anyway, that's off subject. All right, so let's just look at, um, you know, the first question we had was, who wants to bring glory to God? So if we look at how did Jesus bring glory to God? And so we look at a few passages here, like in Matthew 15, 30 and 31. It says, then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Um, by the way, this is Ellen. This is Naomi. Oh, you know her? Y'all know each other? Oh, and I wasn't there. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Ellen, this is Terry. Hi, Terry. Nice to meet you. <laughs> all right. So what we see in this passage is that you know all these great miracles were happening. The lame were made whole. The maimed were made whole. The blind were seen. And then what happened? So it, people glorified God. They were amazed. They were like in awe. Okay. And so when you when you think about that, so they glorified the God of Israel upon Jesus doing these miraculous works. And so if we want to bring great glory to God, one of the ways Jesus did it was by setting these people free and doing these miraculous healings. And when you read the Gospels, what do you see Jesus doing more than anything? Preaching, teaching, and healing the sick. Every, every single time, preaching, teaching, healing the sick. Teaching and healing the sick. Preaching, healing the sick. More teaching, more healing the sick. They always were together. He always taught and healed the sick, wherever he went. And as he's doing that, people are glorifying God. Okay? And, you know, so the person who got healed, they were thankful and they were awestruck. You know, the people who watched, they were awestruck and they glorified God. And then they all went and told everybody they knew. And they brought glory to God. And then as these things occur, people's faith grows. You know, like, um, you can read something in the Bible that says, hey, Bobby, you can raise the dead or you can heal the sick. My faith might be like minuscule, like, yeah, I read it, but I don't know if I believe it. But then you go watch some testimony videos and you see it done. You're like, yeah, I can do that. This is real now. So watching it be done is huge. And these people were watching it be done and their faith just, whoosh, just rose up. Okay. And then they were glorifying God. So we want to do the same things that Jesus did. All right. Then he also did the same thing when he raised the dead, like in Luke 7, 12. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. Okay, so again, we see he raised the dead. These people are awestruck. You know, God suddenly, you know, their invisible God who they'd never seen before was now tangible and visible. Like you could, the acts of God make him seen. You know, the miraculous deeds of God make him visible on this earth. And because it says God has visited his people, they could see God in action. You know, through, through the, the deeds that Jesus was doing. That's pretty cool. And what's even cooler than that is we get to do the same thing. Amen. <laughs> right? We get to do the same thing. We get to do the same thing. Amen? Okay? So, when we do miraculous deeds, when Jesus did miraculous deeds, God is glorified. People's faith arises. You feel good. Your faith arises. You tell everybody. Everybody else's faith arises. And you know, great believing and faith arises around you and around this event. So it's good stuff. And it's fun too. Amen. All right. So this next section is called God wants our faith based in his power. God wants our faith based in his power. John 2.23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs he did. See, they believed when they saw the signs. Amen. And the reason a lot of people don't believe today is because they never have seen proof. They never seen proof that God is real. You know, why should I believe Christians? You know, Muslims have a Bible. Um, I don't even know the names of any religions. Everybody's got a Bible. Whatever Hinduism. other Hindu, Hindus, they have a Bible. Everybody's got a Bible. Everybody has supposed words from God. Um, everybody has kind, generous, loving people. You know, all these things are common to every religion. Why should I believe Christianity? Well, you should, unless you can, you, you need proof. Uh, well, here's a bigger question that I've dealt with. Maybe with my son, some of my spirits. I think about what the church and things are. The church and what the church is like. The question is, it's not, why should I believe it? It's more, why should I believe it? That's
That's why we. That's why we need proof. That's why we need proof. Exactly why. So if you need proof in your life, we will produce proof in your life. Amen. No, I, I agree. So we we will we will we will do that. We will do that. So um, we we're gonna get to that. Remember, um, let's come back to that point when we get to our job description. Okay. okay. All right. Thank God, God wants us to do signs. Okay, so the thing is exactly that problem. People have seen no proof that God is real. And so it says that these people, they believed when they saw the sign. They did not believe before they saw a sign. That's very important. Very few people have seen miracles. Very few people have experienced a miracle. In my life now, since I've learned these truths, like almost every day there's a miracle, like healings. Almost every day. And you know, I'll tell you some examples when we get further along, but like, like, I don't know, yesterday, these three kids got healed. You know, they were sick with fever. And we just got on the phone, this somebody in Costa Rica. He's like, my brother's sick, my niece is sick, and my nephew's sick. I'm like, all right, let's deal with this. And we just, in the name of Jesus, I command this sickness, get out of these kids right now. In the name of Jesus, I command this fever, you leave right now. In the name of Jesus, you know, Liam, Emily, I forget the other one's name. Be healed in Jesus' name. And then the, the next morning I get the text update. Everybody's healed and whole, no fever. They feel good. Everything's back to normal. Thank you, Jesus. And that's, that's everyday life for me now. And I'm just a believer. I work a regular job at a real company doing normal stuff. <laughs> and, but I, my believing has been opened up. And it's, you know, and we're, this is a reality. This is reality. Okay, John 10:37 to 38. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. That's powerful. If Jesus said, if I don't do any miracles, don't believe me. Every every other religion has a bunch of words, but Jesus is saying, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove that my words are real. And if I can't prove it, don't believe me. Okay, so Christianity has got proof. But if I do, though you do not believe me, the words he's speaking, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. That's pretty awesome. So Jesus said that if he can't perform miracles, then we should not believe in him. Miracles are proof. Healing is proof. Answered prayers are proof. You know, we can prove, we can prove it. There's a Christian is a supernatural being. We have the Spirit of God in us, which other religions don't. We can do supernatural things in Jesus' name. And that's, that should be part of our normal life. And that's, that's what life is growing to be for us. Okay? We just didn't know about this stuff, you know. Or I didn't know about any of this until two years ago. But I'm growing quickly. God wants us to grow quickly. Okay? <clears throat> and then I'm not going to read all this, but in Matthew 11, 20... Um, Jesus was talking about, you know, these were some condemned cities like Tyre, uh, Sidon, and Sodom. These cities were condemned. You know, uh, you know Sodom got burned up in fire, right? Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, they got burned up in fire. You know, they had great sin, homosexuality, like, and all kinds of other sin was going on there. And Jesus said, if, if the mighty works which were done in, um, what city was he in? In Capernaum. The mighty works that he did in Capernaum were done in those three cities. They would have turned around. They would have believed God and they would have turned from their sin. And so this says that, you know, signs and wonders are powerful for causing people to believe and causing people to repent. Now, I was a drug addict all my life. And I turned to God and said a little prayer on June 2nd, 2011. And, you know, over 20 28 years of drug use and pornography and lying, cheating, stealing, whatever I was doing, all kinds of stuff. One little prayer, boom, everything changed. I completely remodeled me. <laughs> no more lying, no more porn, no more cheating, no more nothing. I mean, I was just made good, like suddenly. That's a miracle. <laughs> that, that, you know, like I could quit drugs for like a week or two, but the whole time my mind's like chaos, like drugs, alcohol, porn, drugs, alcohol, porn, it won't shut up. There's no peace. And then after that little prayer, it was like silence. I'm like, thank God. 
Yeah. So I experienced God while I was a dirty, rotten sinner. And then I've come to love God because of what he did for me. Not before he did something, but after. Yeah. The Bible says the goodness of God leads people to repentance. So we can do good for your son. That'll cause them to turn. Or good for anyone else. That'll cause them to turn. And when they experience the goodness of God, first the goodness, then the repentance. Some people repent before that, but if not, the goodness will cause you to repent. It'll cause you to change your mind about God, which is what repent means, to change your mind. And that's what we want to do. I love this. Okay, let's go on. Um, okay, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power. In demonstration of spirit and power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That is awesome. So Paul is saying the same thing that Jesus said. He's like, I'm going to tell you some words, but don't put your faith in my words. Put your faith in what you see. Because I'm going to show you God. You're going to see demonstrations of the Spirit. You're going to see demonstrations of power. You're going to see people be healed. You're going to see miracles happen. You're going to see answers to prayer. You're going to see people come out of bondage. You're going to see financial breakthroughs happen. You're going to see that God is real when, when He comes to town, when I come to town, when she comes to town, when either of you are preaching and teaching. God wants everyone who's speaking His Word to back it up. This is cool. This is really cool. God wants us producing miracles and healings and doing these things. That's a, that's a revelation right there. He, wants, he, he doesn't want you trying to like hang on to some words you heard in the Bible. He wants you to have confidence in faith. He wants you to see it live, in person. <laughs> right? Yeah, check it out. There's some, more, there's some more good ones here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. For our gospel did not come to you in word only it did not come in word only but also in power and in the holy spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake and you became followers of us and of the lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the holy spirit okay so it says he didn't come with words only jehovah witness come to your door with words Mormons come to your door with words. Islam comes with words. Whatever other religion, they all they have are words. They can't do a thing. They're powerless. Powerless. But we come with word and power. We come with word and spirit. You know, we can prove that God is real. We can do that. We do do that. We're going to do more of that. Okay? And then what's the result of that? Verse 6. And you became followers of the Lord. You became followers of us and of the Lord okay? so it's good to follow somebody that knows the truth you know I follow Curry Blake, Andrew Womack Torben Sundergaard Pete Cabrera, Todd White I follow people who are walking in power and in love and doing the works of Jesus those are the people that I follow you know I don't I never saw these things in church I don't think I've ever seen a miracle in church except when I did one and I haven't seen it what's that? Except when I except when I prayed for people and seen them be healed, I haven't I haven't been to churches and seen the power of God. It hadn't happened. She and I go to meetings where we see it happen. Uh, Elvin Craig, he believes like we do. Um, you know, we see healings in his meetings every week. Yeah, uh, in Costa Rica, many people got healed last week. People got healed at work last week. And those three kids got healed yesterday. I mean, this is like everyday life. This is normal. Like miracles are normal. It's, it's awesome. Miracles are a normal part of my everyday life now. And it's not Bobby. This, I have the Spirit of God. I have received the Holy Spirit. And so we're going we're gonna to keep talking about that in this teaching. It's really good stuff. You can see I'm smiling. I'm very happy about this. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. So power, the power of God produces believers and that word power when you see the word power like in first corinthians power and in thessalonians power the word power is the greek word because the new testament was written in greek 
It's the Greek word dunamis. And dunamis is the miracle working power of God. It is the strength of God. It is the healing power of God. It is the raising of the dead power of God. It is the moral power of God. It is the excellence of soul power of God. So that's what dunamis is. When it says power, it's not just power. It's like mm, miracle working power. It's awesome. It's the power of God. Okay. So it's not just like power, like I can lift a lot of weights, I'm strong. It's not like that. It's like supernatural power. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Now, think about this. Would, would you say that Jesus was probably the best preacher that ever lived? I, I would say that he was. Okay. He was the original son of God. He was, his, one of his names is the word of God. So you would think that he can, he's probably pretty good with words. It's probably a good, pretty good preacher. You know, if anybody could convince you with words alone, it would probably be Jesus, right? Okay. All right. Do you think you're as good a preacher as Jesus? I don't think I am. Okay. I'll just tell you, you're not. Okay. All right. So since none of us here is a better preacher than Jesus, and Jesus needed miracles, signs, wonders, and healings to cause people to believe, do you really think that your words alone are more convincing than Jesus and that you don't need any miracles to help people believe? I don't think so. I think we all, if Jesus needed miracles for people to believe the original Son of God, then I, I guarantee you we need to produce some proof for people so they'll believe us also. Okay? That's pretty awesome. Okay, now think of an unbeliever that you know. If they saw a miracle, do you think they would believe? So, yeah, because, you know, I, and I know that logic too. Like I've had miracles happen and I'm trying to explain it away. Well, it could have been, it wasn't, you know, like coincidence happens, you know, it wasn't really a coincidence, but it was God planned something. And I'm like, oh, well, it could have been this, this, or this. Logic will kick in and I'll try and come with a logical explanation. That was in the beginning four years ago. Now I'm like, forget logic. I, now I believe God, but four years ago, you know, I would try and scientifically explain away things. I would try and scientifically explain away miracles. So I know what you're talking about. And we just got to chip away at that. You know, a couple of good miracles and just knock it out the park. <laughs> All right. So let's look at how was Jesus equipped to do miraculous works? Okay. So Luke 3.21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. Okay, so let's look at what happened to Jesus. First of all, he was water baptized. He went to be baptized by John the Baptist. Okay? That was just plain old water baptism of repentance. I'm repenting from sin. That's what water baptism is. Okay? That's not baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then the second thing that happened is he prayed. Okay? Jesus prayed. The third thing that happened is the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. Came upon him. Like when you're born again, you have like the Spirit of God's inside of you. It says that we're born of the Spirit of God. You know, and we have the Spirit, uh, you know, us crying out, the Spirit of the Son in us crying out, Abba, Father, when we're saved, right? Okay, but when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's upon you. The Holy Spirit came upon him. He already was born with the Spirit of God. So there's a lot of saved people and the Spirit of God in them, you know, like this much or however much, that much. Okay, but then when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's upon you, it's in you, it's pouring out of you. You're clothed with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's, it's like, it's on you. You're like, oh, you're alive. Like, if you could see me, there's like an aura of the Holy Spirit around me. You know? Yeah, so there, it's, there's something there. Okay? And that's what happened to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then, then his ministry began. He wasn't, and you know, people will make up these myths. Oh, he was like, you know, picking up sand and making birds when he was a kid. And you know, raising dead birds when he was a child. He didn't do that. His ministry began after he got the baptism in the Holy Spirit. 
So he, he was born with the seed of God. He was, already, he was born saved. You know, we get saved at some point. He was born saved because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. When we're saved, then we're conceived of the Holy Spirit also. Okay? Okay, but his ministry began after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's like when it's just all over you. Okay? All right. Acts 10, 38 says the same thing, different words. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with dunamis power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay? So he was anointed. That means it's upon him. Like when you anoint somebody with oil, you pour oil over their head and it just flows all over their body. Okay? He was anointed with the Spirit of God just all over him. Just all over him. Okay? And then once he had that, he, had, he received the dunamis power of God, that miracle working power of God. Once he was baptized in the Spirit. And then he went about doing good, healing, raising the dead, setting people free from oppression of the devil. Because God was with them. It was God was in him, upon him, flowing through him, all these things. And again in Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. See, it's upon him. It's wrapped around him. He's encased in it. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Okay, so all these are saying the same thing. The Spirit came upon him, and then he started doing all these things. Amen. Okay? So, if you want to be equipped like Jesus, because when Jesus came to earth, he had emptied himself of his godness. He was a man on the earth, a born-again man on the earth, until age 30, when he received the Holy Spirit. Then all these things began. And so, he was an exact replica of what we are, you know, or what we are to be. We are to be humans on this earth, born again, and then baptized in the Spirit, so we have the Spirit of God upon us. And then everything Jesus did, then suddenly we can do those same things as our imagination, as our believing opens up. All right. Can we be equipped the same as Jesus? Yes. All right, check it out. John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I, sh I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do because I go to my Father. Did, did you hear that? He who believes in me. Okay, who here is a believer in Jesus? Okay, all right. We're all qualified. Therefore, Terry, sure. Magname, did I say it right? Yeah, Magname. Magname. Ellen, Bobby, all of us believe. Therefore, we will do the works that Jesus did and we will do greater works. Amen. Jesus said that to all four of us here. God wants us to be Jesus on this earth. And like when he said, when the Bible says, imitate me, it means literally, not just, we've like minimized that when, oh, we're supposed to be like Jesus, we're supposed to be loving and kind. That's very human thinking. <laughs> That's so tiny. No, no, God wants us to be like Jesus in every aspect. Amen. Jesus was a son of God. We're sons of God. Jesus did mighty deeds and miracles. He wants us to do mighty deeds and miracles. Jesus had great love. He was moved with compassion and healed the sick. You know, he wants us to act in great love and compassion and, and heal the sick. Jesus had compassion and fed the hungry, multiplied the food to feed the people. He wants us to do the same thing. You know, so let's not minimize it to human thinking. We need to, God said, imitate him like in fullness, okay? So here it is right there, John 14, 12. We get to do everything Jesus did and greater things. So how can, how can we do greater things? <clears throat> well, a couple ways to think about that. So first of all, when Jesus was on the earth, Satan was not yet defeated. Okay, Because when Jesus died on the cross, he went to hell, did a little roughing up downstairs, and, and he defeated Satan. He stripped him of his um, power or authority. Okay, So now we have a defeated enemy. Okay, and we have the when we're baptized in the Spirit, we're equipped just like Jesus. So we have we have the same equipping. We have the opportunity to be equipped the same as Jesus, and we have a defeated enemy. So it should be a little bit easier to beat him up. Okay, Jesus also didn't have like technology like um, like several times a week. People get healed over the phone, like in Costa Rica, 
India, wherever. Jesus didn't do that, so it's a, it's a greater distance work. It's a different work, you know. Who knows what other great, greater works other people do. I'm sure there's many astounding things to come. It's wide open. Okay, but the bottom line is that we need to be doing at least the things that Jesus was doing. Um, and then we can worry about greater things as they come. But let's just catch up to, let's catch up to the standard. Amen? All right. So again, think about the things Jesus was doing. He was preaching, teaching, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, controlling the wind and the waves, you know, as well as many other miracles. So with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all of us are able to do those things. All right? And then Luke 24, 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father, which is the Holy Spirit, upon you. But tarry, wait, in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with the dunamis miracle working power from on high okay so endued that word the greek word means to be clothed with like like you're sinking in the literal definition is, is sinking into a garment like we're like stepping into this holy spirit uniform like a fireman we've got this holy spirit just clothed around us all over us the power of god is upon us that's that's when you're endued with power it's just dripping off of you. I mean, it's just like around you. That sounds good to me. Amen. And then we can see again in Acts chapter 1. For John truly baptized with water. Okay, that's a baptism of repentance from sin. John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so that's the key. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you shall receive the dunamis miracle working power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay? So that sounds a lot like Acts 10 38, where it says, And God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Does that sound identical? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's identical, it's the same thing. Acts 1.8 is for us. Acts 10.38 describes Jesus and they describe the same exact thing. Go back and look at Acts 10.38. It's on the prior page. Uh, on the previous page. Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. Okay? Now read Acts 1 8 again. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Okay, so it sounds identical, doesn't it? Because it is. Okay? So the same equipping that Jesus had, we receive when we're baptized in the Spirit. And therefore, we get to do the things that Jesus did. Okay? And in verse 8, it says, but, And you shall be witnesses to me. Now, what does a witness do? In court, <clears throat> in court, a witness produces evidence. Right? They're going to produce evidence to prove a case in a certain direction. That's what a witness's job is. I'm going to pro provide some evidence. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give evidence to prove a case in a certain direction. We're... Not like a witness with only words. We're a witness with the power, that miracle working power. And so therefore, we're a witness who will produce evidence for that unbelieving person to help them to believe. Um, this is cool stuff. Like God wants us to produce evidence of Him. That's why He gave us His Holy Spirit. Like when we get saved, we have the Spirit of God in us and we're saved. So we're, we're good. Okay, but when you're baptized in the Spirit, that's primarily for the benefit of people around you so that you can minister to them, so that you can perform acts of God in front of them, so that they can believe, so that they can be set free, so that they can see Jesus through you, live in person. Okay? And I'll just tell an example or two. Um, I, was, I was worried about this. <laughs> like I had, I had heard various teaching, um, some teachers say, well, if you're praying for the sick, they have to have faith to receive healing. 
And then I had other teachers that say, well, they don't have to have faith. You have to have faith for them. And if you look at Jesus' example, he had faith for unbelievers. He was, everybody was an unbeliever, right? Or 99.999% of people were unbelievers. He was healing unbelievers. Okay, so um, I had never prayed for somebody I knew that wasn't a believer. And this was like, I don't know, a little over a year ago. And so this lady, this young, you've heard this story. This young lady at work was just walking so slow in the parking garage. And she looked like she was 90 years old the way she was walking. And, I, and I, obviously there was something wrong with her. So I caught up with her in the elevator and I said, you know what? I tried to start a conversation. I'm like, what's, you know, what's going on? Why are you walking all slow? I don't remember how I said it. It was nicer than that. And she said, I'll have this crippling arthritis. And I was like, man, that's weird because she's really young, you know? And, and so I, I looked at her name tag and then I went to my desk and I printed off some testimony stories of healings. And I said, well, I'm gonna go put them on her desk and leave a note and see if she'll meet me so I can pray for her. So I put the testimonies on her desk and she reluctantly met me the, the next day in a conference room. And as soon as we, my, my plan was, I'm gonna go over some scripture and then about healing and then I was gonna pray for her so she could be free of pain. And so as soon as she comes in the room, I just wanna let you know that I'm a practicing Taoist. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> That's a Chinese religion of some sort. I don't know anything about it, but it's a Chinese religion. So it's obviously not a Christian. <laughs> so I'm like, man, the rubber is about to meet the road right here. And so I'm thinking this. I'm like, that's okay. I said, by the time you leave this meeting, you're going to know that God is real and Jesus is God. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? So that's the Holy Spirit working in me because I wasn't quite that bold. That was the Spirit of God. So anyway, I went over some scripture. And then I said, all right, we're going to pray. And so I held her hands. Because the Bible says, lay hands on the sick. So I held her hands. You don't have to like, you know, put it on their head or just touch them, okay? Doesn't matter where, you know. And that could get really weird depending on what's wrong with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we don't want that. Okay, just hold her hands. Okay, so in the name of Jesus, I command arthritis, get out of her body. Get out of her fingers. Get out of her knee, wherever it was. And so we prayed and then things were better. And then we, I think we prayed like, I don't know, maybe three times, five times, you know, and as we were praying, like something was completely separate. By the time we were done, she was pain free. And I'm like, yes, thank God. And I was expecting that she was gonna like, oh, sign me up, I wanna be a Christian. But it didn't happen like that. She was just, she was like, I can't believe that. I can't believe that, you know. She was awestruck and I was just shocked that she didn't want to get saved all in that same moment. You know, but now she knows who God is. So she has proof. I was a witness for God. She was set free of pain. And she knows that in the name of Jesus, this arthritis was gone. That's, that's what God wants us to do. That's a witness. She has evidence. Plus she's set free from oppression of the devil. That's pretty cool. It's fun. It's a little scary too, but <clears throat> when, I mean, the, the things of God will stretch you because um, you're going to have to do some things where you're going to look, it's going to work or you're going to look stupid. And I've looked stupid plenty of times, but just keep going forward. You know, I always, I always think of it like, um, like when I was wanting to date when I was younger, you know, I didn't know how to, I was scary to me walking up to somebody to meet somebody, but you would practice and you would get better. You know, you would look stupid and you would do stupid things and you would say dumb things, but you didn't quit because you, everybody wants to get married and whatever, find that special person. So I liken, you know, stepping out and doing things to those uncomfortable feelings that I was willing to push through for other things in life. I have to be willing to push through those uncomfortable things and the God things of life too. You know, if, if I had worldly desires and I had to go through awkwardness to achieve those, so much more I should be willing to walk through some awkwardness to get, you know, rooted in the things of God. That's what happened. It's okay. All right. Ellen, I'm encroaching on your time. All right. So I have to ask a question to follow up on the story there. So like she has latent energy or latent thoughts or something like this that made her come back to you to be more curious about what she had done. 
Um, yeah, we had some follow-up discussions. Um, uh, the Bible, unfortunately for her, the Bible also says you can cast a demon out. And if they don't fill up, if they don't fill up on God, the demons are going to come back and say, oh, the house is empty. And it's going to bring some friends with it. Okay. okay. She, yeah. she didn't fill up on God. And so she got her friends back. And so we prayed again. And she, you know, again, she was improved. Um, the good thing for her is that she has a Christian husband. So I assume that he's working on her. You know, I have not continued to work with her. Yeah. So, yeah, there's the downside that if you don't fill up on God, those bad things can come back upon you. Which is unfortunate. But she has two undeniable healing experiences where she was set free. There's no... She, she cannot stand before God and say, I didn't know you existed because twice in the name of Jesus, she was walking just fine. Yeah, amen. Yep. So we want her to be stay free though. All right, Ellen, I'm sorry. I'm going to try and go real fast. Okay. Okay. It was so good. okay. Believers job description. Okay. So we saw that we can be equipped the same way as Jesus. And we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then we're equipped like Jesus. Now we just have to work on our believing. But, and here's our job description. Mark 16. Everyone's supposed to be doing this. If we're not doing this, you know, we're going to be in trouble <laughs> when we have our conversation with God. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. <clears throat> will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these miraculous signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay, this is not um, something that we have a choice of doing. This is our job description. You know, this is what he wants us to do. This is to believers, ordinary believers. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And these signs, in verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe, any believer. Not like a pastor of a church, not like an apostle or prophet or whatever, not a special person, every believer. Every believer. Every believer is supernatural. I mean, you got God, we've got God in us. Nobody else has that. We just haven't awakened to what we've got. That's the only thing holding us back. We don't know what we have. That's what we're learning right now. I mean, we're way more awesome than we thought we were. Amen. Amen. We, we thought Jesus was like this one-time person, that God person, that, man, wouldn't it be cool to be Jesus? Well, guess what? He wants it to be cool for Amen. you to be like Jesus. Amen. Right? He wants us to be Jesus. The Bible says Jesus was the first son of God and we are the following sons of God. It says that the earth is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to manifest and free this earth from corruption. All right? I mean, there was, Jesus was one person. Can you imagine if like every person who's a believer today and around all the earth starts acting like Jesus? Man, there wouldn't be a demon, disease, or problem left. We could turn things around in a hurry. I mean, look at all the good Jesus did. One person. And as disciples, you know, there was like 12 and 70 and then others, you know, they were like turning the place upside, right side up. And could you imagine if the, the whole church today would wake up to this stuff? Man. Okay, so we got to do our job description. So we got to cast out demons, heal the sick, speak in tongues, you know, play with snakes, let them bite us. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> um, we can drink poison, it won't hurt us. Okay, so the bottom line is we need the Spirit of God to do these things. God wants us to do this. This is our job description. This is His expectation of us. And this is what we need to be doing. And so we're, we're beginning on that. Okay? Now I just want to point, this is reality. This is real life. You know, for many people are starting to wake up to this. There's a lot of good teaching out there right now. A lot of people are waking up to this. You know, Curry Blake is teaching thousands of people. Todd White is teaching thousands. Pete Cabrera. Um, Turban Sundergaard, Andrew Womack, and there's, I'm sure there's others, but there's at least five of them that are producing Jesuses. So, 
sign me up, okay? So let me go ahead into the next section. So how do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? So there's really two ways. Luke 11, 9 through 13 says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he, he, who, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, you know, one way of receiving the Holy Spirit is just to ask for him. Okay, that's one way. Okay, here's another way. Acts 19, verses 2 through 6. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And that's a lot of the church today. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John, John's baptism. And that's water baptism into repentance. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Okay? So in this case, he, to he told them about the Holy Spirit, he taught them, and then Paul laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So that's another way. Asking for it's one way, laying hands on is another way. Okay? So I'm going to continue talking about the Holy Spirit for probably another couple sessions. And then after we've done a couple sessions, if anyone's not received the Holy Spirit, then we'll pray for the Holy Spirit. But let's we want to just build our faith up a little bit and build up our desire. I mean, this is the most incredible gift of God, salvation and receiving His Holy Spirit. And we get to be Jesus. That's awesome. All right, so let's just close up um, my piece anyway. Daddy, thank you for this awesome word. Daddy, we just love the fact that we are children of yours, that we are believers. You've given us your spirit inside of us, crying out, Abba, Daddy, Father. So, Daddy, we thank you for that. And, Daddy, we thank you for this next step, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Daddy, we just pray that you will just continually bring to our remembrance and remind us of the things we learned today. Hey, I'm a miracle worker. Or, hey, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hey, I want to be Jesus. Hey, I am Jesus. I can do the works of Jesus. Daddy, I just pray that you will just inundate our thoughts with thoughts of of receiving your spirit of operating in with your spirit doing the works of jesus they let this just sink in deep into us let us quickly become fully manifested sons of god and we just thank you right now and amen